Great pleasure to be here, really good opportunity to talk. Um, I feel a bit guilty because I'm not going to be particularly talking about safety, um, but I'm, I'm going to be talking about balanced communication of evidence. Um, I should say my funding isn't from the Lloyd's Register, it's from a hedge fund, Winton Capital Management Fund, my chair. And um, we've got this website, Understanding Uncertainty. We do all sorts of things on that. I'm Professor Risk on YouTube. There's two of me there taking my clothes off for some reason. That I've forgotten. And, um, and I do a lot of sort of popular science stuff. I've done TV programs. I do a lot of schools work, a lot of radio work. Um, I wrote that book, Sex by Numbers, which um, I took a long time to write. Actually, it took quite a long time to choose the cover. That was going to be the cover. And they said... But they said, no, we couldn't have that as a cover. Nobody would read that on the tube. So that's, not the, that's the cover they dare not show. So that's just one of the ways in which communicating numbers and statistics can possibly get you into trouble. OK, so why bother to communicate well? Why, you know, why am I interested in this? I'm a statistician. That's, why, that's my profession. But I really believe, first of all, it's an ethical duty to do that, to actually have transparent communication. We shouldn't just be telling people what to do. We've got to free ourselves from that paternalistic attitude. It's because it contributes to informed choice, whether it's someone choosing their medical treatment or how to vote. They can make an informed choice. It means we're encouraging realistic expectations about the world. We're not trying to delude people. We're trying to educate professionals so they can carry out their work better. We're empowering people and their networks, the great power now of, of social networks, of support groups, and so on. Um, this is my favorite definition. This is one that's been explored by some American psychologists, where the good communication can encourage immunity to misleading anecdote. And if you want to find a misleading anecdote, all you have to Google is any medical condition, and you'll find a huge stream of misleading anecdotes. So can we actually breed some immunity to this? And people have done randomized trials that show if you do use some of the techniques I'm going to be showing, people are less influenced by the sort of drivel that you find on the internet. Okay, the crucial thing, and this is part of the ethical duty that I'm just setting as a principle, I'm not going to argue about it, sorry, you've just got to accept it, that we are trying not to influence people and trying to not to get them to do something. We're not trying to manipulate them. We're not trying to force them into a particular type of behavior. That's what, that I'm just, that's what I say. Sorry, I, uh, sorry, if you don't like it, I don't care. So that's what we're trying to do. Okay, so the first thing, of course, is to study, although I'm a statistician, to study the psychology. And, and there's been so much work on this recently. Of course, there's Danny Kahneman's work on thinking fast and slow. And that's given rise to all the interest on framing. Um, here's a nice bit of framing. Uh, I took this picture in the, in the, in the underground. This was the 99% campaign. 99% of young Londoners uh, do not commit serious youth violence. Ah. Oh. Hug a hoodie. We've all got it wrong. We, we've all got it wrong. Yeah, we, we should, we're being deluded. Uh, but what they don't want you to do is change the frame. Now, how do I change the frame? I can change the frame by reversing it to say 1% of young Londoners do commit serious youth violence. And then I can change it to absolute numbers by saying the population of London is about 8, 9 million. That's about a million between 15 and 24. 1%, call those young Londoners. 1% of a million is 10,000. Oh, my God. That's 10,000 violent young maniacs in this city. My goodness me, this is a dangerous place. So you're not supposed to do that. that is, it's, a, it's for the best of possible reasons. That's a manipulative frame of reference. Um, and here's another one, a beautiful one. This is, you may have seen this story last year about the killer bacon sandwiches, as dangerous as cigarettes. No, they didn't say that at all. They didn't say they've got the same cancer risk. What they did say is they said there's similar levels of evidence that they are carcinogenic between processed meat and cigarettes. They didn't say it was the same magnitude of risk. And I'll come back to that later. The huge confusion that happens in a lot of popular discourse between the, the, the magnitude of the risk and the evidence for it, that the risk exists. These get bandied around. I'd like to, the second half of my talk is really going to be pushing. We've got to distinguish these in our communications very clearly indeed. So what actually does the message say? The message said the WHO eventually got round to promoting this rather than a grossly misleading bit of risk communication they did at the first. 50 grams of processed meat, there's a couple of rashes of bacon uh, a day, is associated with an 18% increased risk of getting bowel cancer. Okay, that's the message. That's the communication. Do we care? Do we care? Do you care? Who had a bacon? Who had bacon today? Anyone eat bacon today? No, some, I didn't. I usually, when I'm giving this talk, try to make sure I've had a bacon sandwich. They just to show I've got my daily carcinogen. 
just to show it. So do I care? Do I care about having occasional bacon sandwich? Well, the crucial way, way to think about these things, it's well known, this is the relative risk communication, been shown in endless psychological studies and meta-analyses that this is the manipulative frame of risk communication to talk about relative risks. We need to know the absolute risks, and for that we need to know the baseline. Actually, 6%, you know, 6 out of 100 people, well, what are, let's say there's 200 people here, so you know, 10, 12 of people in this audience will get bowel cancer during their lifetime, sadly. Okay, so what does an 18% increased risk of a 6% absolute risk mean? Well, these are difficult calculations. I know of no journalist that can do this calculation. They always phone me up or somebody else, like, can you just check my workings and things like that. I should say now we are trying to get this into the school syllabus because school kids should be able to do it even if journalists can't. So what, how do we communicate that? We use the idea of expected frequencies. What does it mean for 100 people? So there's 100 people sitting at like you, smug, middle class, professional people eating their muesli and compote and I know, yeah, I know, I know the sort. And sadly then six out of 100 of you will get bowel cancer during your lifetime. Let's pretend you're a whole audience of slobs sitting down every morning for a three rasher greasy bacon sandwich every single day of your life. That's how many will get bowel cancer. Sorry, did you notice the difference? That's it. That's the one extra. That's the 18% relative increase over the 6%. One extra case. 100 people, those 100 people have to eat that every day of their lives for that one extra case. Now, do we care? No. Tuck in. Get out the brown sauce. So, so I wouldn't say, you know, you want to eat them every day, but actually maybe this is not such a massively important personal thing. So the, the crucial thing is that the framing, the manipulation can change our emotional response. I've deliberately reframed it the other direction to try to manipulate your emotional response and say, oh, actually, it doesn't matter very much. And I can do it. I can make something look big or look at, make it look small. Typically, this will happen in direct-to-consumer advertising, which we're not allowed to do in this country, but they can do in the States and New Zealand. Lipitor, your favorite statin, for many, many of you might be on this, will reduce your risk of heart attack or stroke by 36%, which it will, it's true. And if you read the small print, it'll say, over five years, that means the risk goes down from 3% to 2%. That means 100 people have to take Lipitor with possibly some side effects for five years to prevent one heart attack or stroke. Put that way, maybe we don't mind so much about skipping the statin. But the deliberately, the big framing, the big font is manipulative advertising of the risk. Uh, now, <laughs> this is one I, I was involved in, I have to admit. Um, one of the, um, climate change, climate change. People communicating the risks of climate change uh, in the past um, they would produce a range of possibilities, you know, a sort of 90% interval or something like that, and the press would always tend to pick up the worst possible one. Oh, it could be, temperature change could be as high as. And then they'd show a picture of a polar bear on an ice flow and this sort of stuff. So that's, now, that's known as climate porn which is now people are generally trying not to do that, trying not to bring that sort of manipulative frame. And I was involved in DEFRA in this country trying to produce, um, communicate these risks, the range of risks. This is the um, temperature change in the warmest day of the summer by the 2080s under the medium emission scenario. Um, in the middle, you know, the, the expected one is about four degrees. Uh, the, 90, the bottom end, 10% point, is not gonna change at all. And top, top end, we're all gonna boil. Okay, so how do you communicate? And that, we don't want to say the temperature range could be as high as that, so what do we say? It's very unlikely to be greater than that. You see I've changed a negative frame to a positive frame? Instead of saying could be as high as, I say very unlikely to be greater than. Changes the whole emotional appeal, didn't get the press coverage in the, in that was, we didn't want. So you see, I, I, I embarked, I, I you know, joined in that bit of manipulative reporting but because I felt it was a way to avoid unnecessarily negative um, press coverage. But you just see how simple choice of words, numbers do not speak for themselves. The language, the framing, the imagery is incredibly important. So we need to know about that as communicators. We don't just give, I mean, <laughs> safety, I, I haven't got much about it. Safety, safety, I have to say, is one of some of the worst communication that there is in safety, absolutely terrible. Flood risks in terms of return periods, a one in a hundred event, year event, terrible, the worst bit of risk communication you could ever do. Um, I've, I've looked at safety cases for offshore oil installations, you know, submitted to the health and safety executive that summarize it by saying the, the ERPA is five times 10 to the minus four. 
Do people know what an ERPA is? Or anything? It's the individual risk per annum. It's saying that each, you know, on average, the average risk of getting killed on this oil rig is, is five times ten to the minus four, a one in the two thousand chance that you'll get anybody will get killed each year in, on this oil rig. That's um, that's within the margin of just within the margin of acceptability of is not up to the level of unacceptable. Health and safety is uh, one in one in a thousand chance is considered an unacceptable level. But ERPA is five times ten to the minus four. Huh? That's communication. It's terrible, and it could be done so much better. So these are numbers that are being presented without any effort to, to engage people with them, to show the context. Is this big? Is this small? How does it compare with anything else? And actually, I think this is increasingly unacceptable. Finally, of course, we might just get to number abuse, such as the classic 350 million quid on the side of the bus. Um, used in the Brexit campaign. So that's the ultimate in, in just using numbers as a rhetorical device uh, rather than to inform people. So what can we do about it? Can we do things better? Can we get beyond this use of numbers as rhetorical devices, trying to make them look big to frighten people or look small to reassure them? Because I can guarantee if you listen to the news, if you listen to the radio, you listen to any spokesman, any time a number is used, they're trying to make it look big or small to manipulate your emotions. Just show me an example where that's not the case. And it's a disgrace, really. We've got to get, we should try to get beyond that. So can we do things better? Can we do balanced communication? By balanced, I don't mean like a radio program where you have two people at the extreme spectrum shouting at each other, trading statistics and saying, I don't believe your statistics. That's not balance. That's some pretend BBC idea of balance. Balance is when you have uniform reporting of potential benefits and harms. So the good side and the bad side, the downside and the upside are presented with equal emotional salience in, in the same units, the same graphical or, or imagery associated with them. So can we do that? I'd like to give an example of where people have tried to do that. And that's in the current cancer screening pro, um, leaflets that women get in this, in this country at the moment. After a lot of debate, these were revised in 2013. I was on the committee that drew them up, along with psychologists and nurses and patients and doctors and everybody was in there, all arguing for months about the exact wording on this. And, but the crucial thing is, and I think these are possibly unique in this way around the world, is that they're based on consider the offer of having breast screening. It presents the pros and cons in a balanced way, and it doesn't recommend that women have breast screening. So it's a breast screening leaf that does not recommend breast screening. It's not trying to persuade people to go for breast screening, which it was before. And that's the same for the cervix and the bowel screening leaflets as well. So there's a major, major innovation of trying to treat people as adults, as that they can make up their own minds, and, and acknowledging that given exactly the same information, two women might quite rationally come to different decisions, and neither is right and neither is wrong. Okay, so um, th th one of the crucial things I want to emphasize as well is that Experts don't just decide this, how to do this. It's not communication, we'll just tell you. You have to listen. The first rule of communication is to shut up and listen. And we uh, had a fantastic you know, citizens jury who looked at all the possible materials. I think I prepared about 20 different graphs and tables for them. And then I had to leave the room while they decided which one they liked. I, I wanted to persuade them to pick the ones that I wanted. And bless them, I love them dearly. They picked the ones I wanted them to. They pick things like this, what are known as expected frequency trees in the trade. What it means for 100 women going for breast screening, 96 will get a normal test, fine, reassured. Four will get a recall, but don't panic. Out of those four, most of them won't have cancer. Just because you get a recall doesn't mean you've got cancer. So it's a very simple um, graphical display. No mention of sensitivity of the test, no mention of percentage accuracy or any of that stuff. Just what does it mean for 100 people? Boom, full stop. So, now, that's just on each test. More controversial is to say, what does it mean over the whole, what's the benefits and harms of the entire cancer screening program for people to go for screening? Okay, here we've got 200 women going for screening over 20 years, 15 will develop breast cancer, 12 will be treated and survive, fantastic, 80% survival rate now from breast cancer, sadly, three will die early from their breast cancer. Very simple, very simple figures, just averaging over everybody. And let's look at 200 other women who don't go for screening, decide not to, and the same number will develop breast cancer, eight will be treated and survive, four will die early from their breast cancer, one extra death, that's one early death prevented from the screening program out of the 200 women. However, three of these women will never know they've got breast cancer. 
because they'll have a cl subclinical form, they won't get symptoms. They'll, they'll, it, it, it'll be a form that doesn't grow and doesn't disturb them. So that means the, the harms and benefits of the screening program, there's the benefit one for your death, three un unnecessary treatments. That's 4,000 women a year in this country treated unnecessarily for breast cancer because of the screening program for the benefit of 1,300 lives saved or early deaths prevented. Those figures are in the leaflet. Um, there's some evidence that, that well, <laughs> since the leaflet, the percentage of women going for screening has gone down. Now, this wasn't the intention of any way of the thing. It's not clear that it's because of the leaflet, because it wasn't introduced as a, in an experimental manner. However, it, it could mean that people are actually deciding that given those harms and benefits, I won't go for screening. And that is, frankly, it's okay. The people doing the screening program might not like it, but it's an informed choice. One of the things that isn't in the leaflet, the numbers are in there, the picture isn't. The graphic got taken out as almost the last draft, which I was a bit, actually I was more than a bit grumpy about, because <laughs> we slogged away at this. No, they, the, um, it was decided it was too complicated for people to understand, which is a real shame, because the numbers are in there. Um, and uh, th this makes me think, actually, there's a bit of a paradox about providing communication materials for people in that um, leaflets are optimized for people with a reading age of 11 and a very low numeracy. So we're producing materials for people with very low numeracy and literacy to read. And that's very reasonable. It should be provided for them. However, there's some evidence that such people are not so interested in the informed choice, in you know, essentially looking at the evidence and making up their own minds. So you've got a paradox that the leaflets are written for people who don't want to read the leaflets. So the answer to that is, of course, is that one size does not fit all. You need layered communication. You need gist, that's why websites are so good. You need stuff at the gist level, as it's known, technically. The gist level, just to give the feeling of it. You don't need numbers even. You have pictures, colors, you know, traffic lights, something like that at the top level. Then, for people who want to know more, you can get around to the numbers. Tables, a good table is fantastic. A good table is a graphic. It's, it's a wonderful, people like good tables. And then for people who really want to know more, they can find out the evidence and the uncertainty behind those numbers, third level down. And those are for the real obsessives, like probably like people in this audience. So, um, so the, I, the other little point I'd like to make is that these expected frequency trees uh, are now in the, for this country, in the GCSE, that's the 11 to 16 year old maths syllabus for teaching probability. Um, we, a group of us you know, said that this has been shown in endless psychological studies that this is the most effective way to communicate chance and probability to individuals. Um, it's been a lot of uh, formal experiments. And now it's in the GCSE math syllabus. And uh, it got in the math syllabus and the teacher said, yeah, but we don't know how to teach it. And so I we've got to give a plug. We've written a book which is out now on the first of the Cambridge mathematics season, um, which is for how to teach probability in secondary schools using this idea of expected frequencies. So, small plug there um, for any teachers here. So, uh, who else is trying to do this kind of thing? You probably can't read that in detail, but th there's this idea of a drug facts box. You know, instead of just you know, any information about a drug should be given in a, the, I, uh, an absolute similar form. So, whatever drug it is, the, the form of communication is always the same, so you can look, look at it. So if this is um, if people who get the drug and people who don't get the drug, what percentage benefit and what percentage get what, so certain side effects? So the side effects and the benefits are given exactly the same salience, although the benefits do come first, and, and the communication is done in a completely symmetric way. So that, I think, is a fantastic um, innovation. That oh, They've struggled for years to get the FDA to, make, to force the companies to do this and haven't succeeded. Um, this is even more complicated. This is the Cochrane Collaboration. Um, have an interactive summary of findings tables. Cochrane Collaboration are people who review all the medical evidence in the world towards particular innovations. And they, for example, then will say what the effect is with and without a drug. 34 per thousand will um, have a harm. 23 per thousand with the drug. The difference is 11 patients per thousand. You can see graphics of this, et cetera, et cetera. You can interact with it. You can get all the definitions. What the other thing I should point out is they got this thing of certainty of the evidence. So remember that. This is called the grade scale. So that, that stroke thing is a four-star bit of data. The uh, deaths is only a three-star bit of data. So what they're doing then is get, get, talking about something about the effect of this drug and then saying how sure they are, how good the evidence is behind that, which is a second level down for the, you know, the people who really want to know, or third level actually down, because this is already the second level down. So this is the kind of thing that people are trying to develop, make, make them um, uh, 
uh, generally accessible. Okay, this is much more to do with individual risk, you know, what are the chances for medical treatments. What about societal risks? Things that are going to impact, you know, huge numbers of people. Um, well, it, I'm interested not so much in just risks, but just alternative policies, any policy that could have good sides or bad sides. It might have benefits, it might have harms. How can we communicate the expected impact of different policies and not try to set, persuade people to be for or against the policy? Just say, this is how it is. It's less, this is far less research than individual risks. The stuff I've been talking about, there's a lot of research in psychology about it. The idea of how to communicate to whole populations about the risks they face as a society and the, the appropriate metrics, the language, in a, in to, is not researched properly at all. It's a, it's a, it seems to be a completely open area where people do it all the time, but they don't do it very well. You know, people who try to do that already, for example, in the UK, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, says it's just going to tell it like it is. It's not going to advocate a policy. It's not going to say you should do this. Just this is how it is. This is what the evidence says. You have to restrain yourself. Even if you do believe in the policy, you mustn't say it. Okay. Um, it's interesting is that this expected frequency, um, you know, what does it mean for 100 people? When you're talking, communicating to you about your risk, it's a very popular metaphor to use. What would it mean for 100 people like you? Or and alternatively, a, a, a metaphor I really like is a, a hundred ways things might turn out for you, this is the sort of proportion we'd expect. But when we talk about it with society, we really are talking about 100 people. It's no longer a metaphor. We're really saying wh what we expect to happen to 100 people. So they, they, we can use the same imagery, even the same graphics, but the interpretation is slightly different. Okay. I, I should say I'm not talking about catastrophes and disasters. If, if a hurricane's on its way, if, there, if there's you know, potential disaster, if you're trying to get people to evacuate, maybe that's not the right time to give a completely balanced view about everything. Maybe you just go and say to people, ah, evacuate, you know, just, get, just get them to do something. So I, I'm not talking about emergencies in this. Now, who's tried to look at societal risk? Well, climate change, of course, as I mentioned already, the big one. And the IPCC has struggled to communicate uncertainty. And they spent years on it. And I think have made quite a good job of it in the end. First of all, they, they use words to describe probability. So when they say, you know, extremely likely, um, extremely likely isn't in that table, but it corresponds to more than 95%, they'll say it's extremely likely that um, most of the majority of the temperature change of the last 100 years is due to man. That's what they conclude. And that means at least 95% chance. Now, so they will use these words, which is good, but they will only use those words and those numbers if the evidence is rather good. So they also assess their confidence in the science, in the conclusion. So again, it's that second level. There's, there's what the uh, risk is and how sure are we about that? And they do this by looking at, um, they've got a, a confidence scale based on the type of evidence, the amount, the agreement, and only if you're fairly confident about the evidence will they give a probability statement. So you get statements like this, I'll read this out. Um, anthropogenic influences likely contribute to the, to the retreat of the glaciers since the 1960s. But due to a low level of scientific understanding, there's low confidence in attributing the causes of the observed loss of mass on the Antarctic ice sheet over the past two decades. So they're not going to say that man has caused the Antarctic ice sheets to shrink. They might actually believe it, they have, but they just don't have enough confidence in science to give a prob even a probability that man has been the co main cause of the Antarctic ice sheet shrinkage. So I, th I think that's got humility, it's got balance, they're trying to do it right. We might also learn from other people who are trying to communicate um, the impact of different policies. And uh, in the UK, we've got these What Works centres, which I think is a fantastic innovation in a wide range of areas, in health, um, in education, and crime, and things like that, who are supposed to review the evidence and tell people what actually works, what works. So, for example, in education, um, it'll say that, um, for example, uh, you know, different things, it'll say it's got how much it costs for different interventions, how good the evidence is, so pretty crummy evidence about aspiration interventions, really um, not much evidence at all, and this is the effect size. So this is an interesting metric they've got in education. The effect size is the number of months it gives you, the pro of progress it gives you. How much it boosts, how much older it makes you almost. How much, how much it pushes you through your development. So it's a beautiful, so all their educational work, they convert it all to months. It's a very vivid, a very vivid metric. 
So it's got the effect size and the evidence behind it written out. And, and you can see, I mean, for example, I should have put it up there, but things like old traditional ones like keeping someone back a year is, is, is the absolute worst one at all. It's just the worst intervention you can do. Um, and if a crime, you've got another one, all these different you know, crime facilities you can do, what's the impact and what's the evidence for those and what the cost is for these different for these different um, interventions. So people are systematically working through all these different options and policies you can do, trying to code them up into what the effect size might be and how confident we are in the science behind them. I think it's a very powerful idea and um, it, it, it's to be really encouraged, um, in other words, to get a balanced view. Okay, so just, just to finish off, my manifesto, ba -bam, and this is, you know, it's just what I believe, I suppose. Uh, we all, public professionals, policymakers, and media, we've got a right to receive quantitative evidence in a way that is appropriate for the decision being faced, is transparent and balanced, is not manipulated to try to push me one way or another, uses best design, all this modern psychology there is available, is developed in close cooperations with the consumers, the users, the audience, and caters for variation and numeracy, is leveled, so it doesn't just, it's not one size fits all. And acknowledges uncertainty and limitations of the others. You don't think that's, that doesn't seem too much to ask for, except it doesn't happen. It's not there at all. I don't think that's too much to ask for, and I think it's a reasonable thing. And again, I'd like to uh, give huge um, uh, acknowledgement and credit to Winton Capital Management, David Harding, who's just given us a trough load of money to form a center for risk and evidence communication in Cambridge that is going to try, is going to be based on those principles and is going to try to be doing just those things, both at an individual uh, advice level and a societal, societal level. This is a really active area, I think, a very exciting area for the future, and um, I'm really pleased to be part of it. So in the future, maybe in the future, instead of that big red bus that we had, we might have a bus like that, which gives a slightly more nuanced message. Okay which you might better read that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robert Varity from the University of Arizona in the US. I would think that the Donald Trump phenomenon must be your nightmare scenario because <laughs> we're witnessing something like 30% of the population that strongly supports him that is completely oblivious yeah. Yeah. to everything you've just said. Exactly. No, not just oblivious, <laughs> actively, actively against it. Yeah, actively yeah. against yeah, it. Yeah, where exactly. What we're witnessing is that people can <laughs> say anything they want and yeah. it makes no difference. Yeah. No, we got the same, this post-truth society idea that grew up after Brexit as well. And I must say, you know, the Brexit debate and the Trump debate, at first, my reaction was just to give up. I'll, I'll just retire. I mean, what's the point? What's the point, I felt? And then I thought, no, no, don't give up. Come on, got to fight back. Got to fight back. And you won't be able to persuade everybody. Um, even in personal decision, I mean, interesting, I don't, I'm not going to ask individuals, but just think about well, if you go to a doctor and you know, you've got something wrong with you and they, and they don't tell you what to do, they just give you a list of options, how, how happy do you feel about it? And many people, you know, and I reckon there's more than, the doctors I talk to, more than half would say, oh, oh, you know, what would you do? Tell me what to do. They just say, tell me what to do, tell me what to do. I don't want to decide. And that's fair enough. If people want to do that, that's fair enough. But it, for people who do want to actually engage with the evidence, engage with the magnitudes of the issues, then I think they deserve to have proper information. But we shouldn't just give up. And we, we need to give them proper information. So I think the um, Trump campaign should be a stimulus to try to do better. I mean, because otherwise you might as well just give up. <laughs> and that's too depressing. I know, I know, I know, I know. But it, it, I think it is a stimulus. I, I now feel stimulated by it, about the appalling way, the quality of the debate. Hello, I'm at the back. Um, my name's Thea Shearer, I'm from UCL. It's a related question, actually, around the work and risk and evidence communication and what you're doing uh, to help people to receive that communication better because I think that that is the challenge that the Brexit uh, issue and, and Trump yeah. has, has yeah. highlighted. Yeah well I mean the first thing is you can't just lecture people 
You'll say, you know, wag your finger and dump them lots of numbers and things like that. No, you've got to genuinely engage them. And that means listening. And that means, to a certain extent, engaging their emotions. Now, this is the problem, of course, with, this, with the business. You know, how much, if we engage emotions too much, we want to engage the emotions enough for them to be interested, want to look at this information, but not so much that they immediately say, oh, my God, and, and just shoot off in, a, in, a, in one direction or another. And, and that's something to, to explore. We've got to, this, idea, this psychological idea of affect means that most people come to an issue such as nuclear power or statins or anything like with a general feeling of either liking them or not liking them. And if they like them, they tend to, to uh, reduce the possible harms in their minds. And if they don't like it, then they um, you know, don't listen to the possible benefits and they just exaggerate the possible harms. So people tend to have a view already about whether they like something or don't like them. And you could say that everything I'm talking about is to try to counter that, to try to say, no, hang on, hang on, just I mean, it's in the Danny Kahneman idea. Just try to think a bit slowly. Just don't always use your non-conscious emotional gut reactions, your system one, I can't remember which way around it is, your fast thinking. You know, maybe just, just try to slow down and engage the slow thinking, the system two, the conscious reasoning. And that's really what we're trying to do. And that's, you know, that's what we're talking about, about trying to get people to engage with stuff, is that just slow down, just slow down. Don't just use, react with your guts all the time. Uh, well, the best way, I'm not sure what the best way to do that is. Um, whether, you, and it obviously has to come from a trusted source. Right? We've heard about um, you know, the Lloyd's Foundation, the Lloyd's Register, wanted to be a trusted source of information. We don't just, you can't just declare, you can't just say, trust me, you have to demonstrate trustworthiness. So um, it, it's terribly important, this is a terribly important issue. And you know, maybe, uh, maybe one will fail, but I think it's worth trying to do. Hi, Ruth Bumpree from the Deutsche Register Foundation. A lot of your examples are about uh, risks to individuals, about commu yeah. uh, communicating those risks. When you um, go into things like vaccination programs or in the safety culture, yeah. if you're trying to say, if you do that, someone else will suffer, how, yeah. how does the way you communicate that change? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, people have strong opinions about e-cigarettes even if they don't smoke. People have you know, opinions about all sorts of things, even if it doesn't directly affect them. And if, they're, if you want them to either sort of support or not support a, a policy, want to make, the, they make up their mind about a policy, um, then you have to talk about the effect on other people. So it's not 100 people like you. The metaphor isn't 100 people like you. It's actually just 100 people. And you, know, you really have to think of this imagery now is of different people, different group of people. So maybe you have to change the imagery a bit, or change the language, certainly. And va vaccinations is, one of the, is a, a terribly important one because it's a mixture of individual and societal responsibility. And it's a very complex one in that case. And the, and the individual risk I, you know, language doesn't hold in those circumstances. But the actual metaphors in the imagery of the hundred people and what does it mean for a group, I think does hold. And people, when you're thinking of societal risks, which, and you might not be one of them, you, know, you have to think of what you feel about that option and what that would mean to this crowd of people. Or you do option B and what it would mean to that crowd of people. And you know, it's, you're back to the same representations of trying to get those in vivid, vivid ways using whole numbers um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a rather similar problem, I think. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.